Good morning. Is this microphone on at all? Okay. It's actually a miracle that I'm up here preaching. Um, <laughs> if you're visiting with us, um, I'm sorry. Uh, this is not the normal preacher. I'm not a preacher by trade. I'm an ophthalmologist. Um, Mitchell asked me to preach a few months ago, and um, everything was going great until this week in which I had to do Wednesday night class here without a microphone, and then Thursday I gave an hour and a half lecture to Johnson & Johnson nationwide, and by Friday afternoon, after seeing my almost 90th patient, I started losing my voice, and as of yesterday at noon, to be honest, I couldn't hardly hear myself, and I uh, thought there was no way I'd be up here. I actually called my father, um, I called Mitchell first, and said, are you sure you're still out of town? Um, he, he was. Um, I actually have no idea where he is. I never asked. And um, I called my dad and um, asked him if there was any way he could, at the bare minimum, get a 10-minute devotional ready. And he could barely hear me, but he said, uh, sure. Um, so uh, he's going to back me up. Uh, he has my notes. Um, and if I can't finish, I'll turn it over to him. Uh, but I'll do the best I can to, to get through um, this lesson. And so this past summer, my family, I took my family to Glacier. Are y'all straight on? Yeah, okay. Mine in the back is completely sideways. I'm looking through a prism. Um, and uh, this past summer, I took my family to Glacier National Park, and uh, it's been kind of on my bucket list of things to do. And uh, many of you heard, hear of keeping up with the Joneses, um, or at least you've heard that phrase. Uh, we're, we're keeping up with the webs, okay? So that's kind of like our, that's like our way of life. So anything I see Cheryl doing, I'm trying to do, okay? And it just so happens that we don't ever even talk. Cheryl and I just talk at church. She's a role model of mine. Mike, Mike and Cheryl are role models of mine and Lori. But we don't, we don't really talk that much. But interestingly, we seem to go on every vacation two weeks after them. So if, if they're heading to Florida, we will find out two weeks later that we went to the same spot in Florida. It just happens like that. And so this is our life. We're a couple of steps behind them. But um, and I wrote this lesson in preparation for going to Glacier National Park with my children. And um, I thought... This is, what we would, this is what we would discuss when we were in the cabin on Sunday, and we decided we'd go to church in, uh, up in Glacier. We decided we would go to church there in Kalispell area, and, uh, which was a blessing. There was about 15 people in the church building, so we, we were about 70% of the church once we added our group. And uh, It was interesting. One week prior to us going there, they have a little map. You put a pin on it where you're from. It's pretty cool, a big, big, big map. Um, so you put a pin like for Crossville or whatever. And the week before uh, that we were there, a family in Lori's hometown church was there, uh, which I thought was really interesting, uh, from Benton, Kentucky. And so um, we did a lot of hikes that week. Uh, we saw a lot of beauty, and, and uh, really my wife wanted to go there just about as much as I did. And so, um, you know, I wanted to make this a reality for her. And so we brought the kids, everybody but Hart, because um, he would have just been in the way. Um, but uh, sometimes you just got to tell the truth. Um, this is a picture of our family. No, um, this is not our family. Um, many of you have heard this term, acrophobic, and uh, this is a term that is an irrational fear of heights. Okay, now I don't think it's irrational for you to think this would be dumb. Okay, so maybe in your mind you think like, well, that's not a big deal to, you know, sit out there in in um, hammocks above a thousand foot divide, but. Acrophobic is really more of an irrational fear of heights, not in this scenario. And, and uh, I don't think that, um, I'm not one to be scared of heights much. Um, I don't want to tightrope across this. Um, and I, I don't want to sit in a hammock above that divide either. But, but I'm not really scared of heights. So I don't have a lot of um, concerns walking on high objects. And I believe that um, from a guy friend of mine that's a kayaker down in Chattanooga, he told me one time, you got to do something every day that gets you a little bit scared. And, uh, and I believe every once in a while you need to do something dangerous. Um, you need to stretch yourself a bit. And uh, you got to challenge yourself to the limits if you're going to figure out anything about yourself and who you are and, and, and what you're going to achieve in your life. Especially when you come to the Christian uh, way of life. And I think God wired us that way. I think God wired us to have an ability to stretch ourselves a little bit. This is a cute man. Um, maybe you know him, his name is Mark Twain, and he said, uh, there's probably no pleasure equal to the pleasure of climbing a dangerous alp, but it is a pleasure which is confined strictly to people 
who can find pleasure in it. And that really is probably true when it comes to mountain climbing. Very few people really want to do it. Um, and, and when I was out and heading to Glacier, I wanted to come up with some things. And, and the lesson I had for my children was a little bit less than this. Um, but then I put some points to it to have a sermon because you can't have a sermon unless you have points. Don't tell Mitchell that. Um, but I wanted to know what can we learn from the mountains? What can we learn from the mountains? Why do we even have mountains? Um, and why are we so compelled to get on top of them? Why, you know, is it just because they're there? You know, George Mallory, he quoted, you know, you know, is it just because they're there? Maybe that's why we want to get on top of them. Or is there really a higher meaning? Is there a grander calling for us to want to get on the top of mountains? And, and, and since the beginning of time, some of the reasons that we don't just admire mountains, um, but we feel compelled to climb them and conquer them is because we are eternally progressing beings. And God designed us that way. God designed us to, uh, predisposed us to take on challenges. We, we have to do that. It, it, it doesn't have to be a physical mountain that you're climbing, but we're, we're divinely engineered to be dynamic. Uh, we're desi- d- divinely engineered to, to not be static. And being in motion is a requisite to progression. Being in physical motion is a requisite to progression. You think about trees. They're put on hillsides, um, and when they're on mountains, if the wind blows against them, you see them swaying, but they don't break. And while Fern Hill didn't say this, um, though I thought she did um, until I researched it, I thought she made it up, um, but it was, it was really an 18th century proverb, but as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. That's the Timothy Hill Children's Ranch um, that we support here at Line Area. But trees have to be, trees when they're placed in areas of wind and and motion, they become stronger to not break. The same thing with our children. I know it's hard for you to believe, but if you held your baby um, all its life, um, it would just be jello, okay? It would not be able to walk. Um, You you would literally not be able to do anything. And if if you think about astronauts, um, the Kelly brothers, the twins that went up into space, Dad and I had the fortune to meet um, Mark and... uh, the, they, they put two twins in space, and one guy went up for a really, 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 really long time. The other one didn't go as long. And his actual physical DNA changed, physically. It was weird. His actual DNA is the only time they'd ever been able to, they've ever been able to figure this out, how he actually had physical differences when he came back. But not only that, he was extremely weak. They try their hardest as astronauts in space to give these like different resistance mechanism training because otherwise they couldn't even walk when they got off for weeks on end. Um, and and we're, we're becoming weaker as generations go as parents, right? I mean, we're weaker. We're coddling our kids more and more. Somebody told me the other day that it's just getting so expensive for a kid to buy a house. And I said, well, yeah, but what about just living in an apartment or a trailer for like 15 or 20 years? And then they could buy a house. Well, no, that's, that's not what my 21-year-old needs to do. We, we, we're becoming weaker every single year. And it's not just parents, it's grandparents. We need grandparents to help us parent. I'd say this. The incline breeds laziness, and it'll impede our progression. So we're going to go over five points, and then I'll get you out of here. Five points on mountains and what they teach us. Um, mountains teach us that not everybody's going to get the prize. Um, it's hard to reach the top. If you summit any mountain, you realize it isn't for the faint of heart. Many try to reach the top, uh, but they don't make it. And 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. I spoke at South Cumberland Elementary a few uh, months ago, uh, thanks to Veda and Lydia Burnett. And I talked to them about how to win in life uh, to their FCA. When you think of mountains and the, and the challenges they pose and, the, and how good they can be for our soul, we have to learn that we're going to have to overcome a lot of things. But even at the end, not everybody's going to get it. 
yeah, we're going to have a lot of summits in our life. There's going to be so many different summits. There may be graduation. Um, I was at a wedding last night in Middle Tennessee. Um, you may have relationships you're trying to build. Um, uh, you may have mission trips you're trying to go on, something you've never done in your life. You've never gone to Africa. That's a summit in your life that you're trying to get over. But the, the truth is there's a lot of essential life steps that they're easily viewed as a hard road. One of my, my father's favorite surgeons, I comment in Canada, he does some of the most amazing high surgery in the world. Well-known surgeon, good friend of mine, that tells me, you know, my surgeries are pretty difficult, but if you break them down into, you know, 50-something steps, it's pretty easy. If you just take one step at a time, you'll get to that step. We're not all going to get the prize, but the hard roads that we take are eventually going to get us to a heavenly prize. Point number two, mountains teach us that few take the narrow road. You think of how few people actually have climbed uh, Everest to the top. The data shows about 30 to 40 percent, depending on what article you read, uh, make it to the top. <laughs> but those people are typically guided. <laughs> the days have changed of Everest. Um, if you go back into the 60s when people were doing it with no guides and had no idea what they were doing, people were dying left and right. If you notice that very few people take the hard trails, like you can be out there completely alone for hours on the hard trail because it's hard. <laughs> Everybody else is on the smooth, they, they drive to the very top, get on the, get on the parking lot that's at the very top and they walk on that flat trail around the mountain because they've, they've got different cutoffs for everybody. But the easy trails are always more crowded than the hard ones. Matthew 7, 13 through 14, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. If you wonder why Mitchell has a hard time reading his slides, if it's like this every Sunday, that's why. Um, it's sideways up there. Um, but don't we typically look for the easy way out? Don't we typically look for it, even spiritually? It, it, I think about it, you know, we're so, it's so easy to just focus on our own family. It's, I've got four kids, um, if you didn't know. And it's so much easier for me to just worry about the four kids instead of anyone else. Instead of anyone else in here. Just focus on my family. If I can do good for my family, that's all that needs to matter. Because that's the easiest route. Um, it's, it's, it's much easier to go out to eat with the same people every single Sunday. It's much easier to never invite anyone over to your house to share God or to, to share life with them. But what if we dedicate our lives to the, the faint of heart, those that are poor in spirit, um, instead of just laying up treasures for our own families? Mountains teach us that few are going to take that narrow road. Point number three, mountains teach us to embrace life's challenges. But, and the question is, like, why mountains? Well, like I told you, that they're, they tempt us, they terrify us, they scare us, um, they test us, they try us, a lot of tease. They, they break us down, though. Mountains truly do. They stretch us. Um, they, uh, they'll bring us straight to a halt. And at, at, but at the same time, they, they stir us. They stir our soul a little bit. Mountains um, inspire us that you have this transformative ability to do something you never thought possible. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll give you this ability to feel courageous um, step by step. And, and it's only when you push yourself beyond your perceived capacity that we discover that we have this courage, this fortitude to continue on our journey. You think about a tennis player that wins a major championship. But I don't know if you've ever watched a tennis match, but you should. Um, you should at least watch the championship so that when you see the last point, it happens every single time. They fall straight on the ground. And they, they, they almost always are weeping. And, and they're not weeping because somebody that's close to them just had a, a bad thing happen to them. They're weeping because of how much effort they put in, and they finally got it. They put in that much effort until they finally broke through, that they were mentally exhausted. 
that they embraced the challenge that they got through it. Australian uh, mountaineer that's a very famous guy, Greg Child, he said, somewhere between the bottom of the climb and the summit is the answer to the mystery of why we climb. And that's, that's true in mountains. Mountains teach us, number four, that obstacles will come, but we must overcome them. An uphill climb is hard enough. Um, if you climb an uphill, uh, Lori and I climbed the Manitou Incline years ago. Um, that was incredibly hard. It's railroad ties on the side of the mountains in Colorado Springs. You start out at about 8,000 feet, and you just keep going until you're dying. Um, the, world, the world record's um, like 28 minutes from an Olympian, um, and uh, it took us like an hour and 40-something minutes. Um, you're literally hand climbing up railroad ties straight up the side of a mountain. Um, it, was, it, it, was, it was really hard. Um, but one of the challenges in high altitude journeys is not just that um, you can't, uh, that you're, you're having to walk uphill, it's that you can't breathe as well. Um, you um, seem to have things that come up little pesky obstacles no matter what, right? It, it may be an animal um, that gets in the way, um, but it could be just the, the weather. Um, the weather in the upper parts of the mountains is, is quite amazing, right? It, it, in, in 20 minutes time, you could be burning up freezing to death and being poured on rain with 50 mile per hour winds. You don't know. It's completely unpredictable at high altitudes. You have no idea what's going to happen. And so you can go out there and you can start your climb. And if you start and you're like, you know what, it's pretty warm right now. Well, that's a bad decision if you didn't bring your coat or your windbreaker because you're going to get up there and you're going to get hammered and you're going to freeze to death. That's what happens to people, right? Um, they, they literally freeze to death. Um, and these kind of things. Mountains teach us that we're going to have obstructions um, and the obstacles are going to come. James says, he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And I think, you know, we may ask ourselves when we're in these mountains in our own lives, you know, is this really worth it? I don't really see any way around it, but is it really worth it to keep going? And the answer is, yeah. The answer is, yeah. You've got to keep going. You're going to have these obstacles in your life. And and, and to be very sure, you're going to have some extremely dark, dark moments in your life. You're going to have major physical, emotional, spiritual um, problems that you're going to face. And but the funny thing is, when I analyze my own problems, um, I realize most of them are really just little (laughs) molehills. When you sit back and think about it, right? If you if you sit back and and sit back and think about what you're going through, they're they're usually molehills. They're not really mountains. Uh, They're not really Mount Everest. But, you know, it, when we first had our first kid, it's like everybody these days, you, if you say you're busy to someone, they're like, oh, you don't even know. Um, it, no matter who you're talking to, everyone says that. I talk about this all the time. Everybody says they're covered up with work, no matter what it is. It doesn't matter. Everyone's covered up. It's amazing. Um, it's, like, it's like taboo, something to say all the time, but we don't want to talk about that everyone's busy. Everyone's grinding. Everybody's working as hard as they can. But we had one kid, and people say, well, just wait till you have two, and we have two. Remember, we're trying to follow the webs. So then we had three, and then we had four. And people still, you know, once we got to four, they were like, just wait till you have five. I was like, we didn't want to have four, you know. But no matter what, it's never good enough. There's always going to be somebody out there that's got 10 kids, 20 kids, somebody that's working 100 hours, you're working 40. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you say to those people. There's always going to be somebody putting you down. But, but we should probably give a little understanding that life is hard. It's busy and hectic for everyone. You're not alone. When I was at Glacier National Park, I was dealing with a guy um, named Gene Underwood. He's a patient of mine. <clears throat> I took his eye out eight weeks ago. Seven specialists in the state of Tennessee, including myself, were on his case, including Vanderbilt University of Tennessee. And I was going through that case the entire week. I was on the phone umpteen times with doctors all across the state of Tennessee trying to figure out a way to solve this guy's infection. Um, and Vanderbilt ended up sending him back to me to do the surgery. Um, and uh, we had a... We had a um, kind of a celebration. I don't know how you celebrate something like this. Um, last week, because he'd gotten through all of his surgeries, he'd had 11 surgeries, um, seven I think that I did, and ending with a, an eye taken out. And he honored us last week in our practice. And everybody that was a part of this, because of how thankful he was that even though he had gone through obstacles, he felt so blessed to be alive and that God had given him another day of life from one of the most wicked infections. So I think of the, the problems I'm experiencing, I'm like, it's pretty, it's pretty minor compared to what Gene went through. But the interesting thing about mountains is they freeze us from fear. They freeze us. They paralyze us. And if we're not careful, these obstacles in our path will, will completely grip us. They'll completely stop us. Lastly, point five, mountains teach us that faith is necessary, and you've got to find it on your own. 
if you're going to climb any mountain, you've got to have faith. You've got to believe. You've got to have courage. You've got to be mentally fit for the challenge. But you've got to have your own. It doesn't matter that your mom thinks you're good at something. Sometimes a patient comes to me and says, you know, your mom told me you're really good at this. I'm like, that's great. But if my mom told you that I was bad at this, I would be really concerned, okay? She's going to tell you that I'm good at it. That shouldn't even give you any confidence. You need to find somebody else. My mom's going to tell you how great I am. She believes in me. Of course she does. Don't you, if you're a mom, you believe in your kids. But we have to teach our kids, they've got to be able to believe on their own. They've got to have their own faith. The biggest fear most people have is their kids are going to leave this high school in, in umpteen years, however long it is for any of you all. Do you not have kids? You have kids, you're already gone. And they've got to have their own faith. But to get them to their own faith, we've got to teach them. We've got to show them. We've got to do it as a church. We've got to do it as a people. My confidence in my own self and my, and my God that I serve has grown dramatically since I've gone to Freed Hardeman and I came back here 12 years uh, after leaving. And you're not going to climb any mountain without a belief. You're not going to climb any mountain without a faith. And you aren't getting a relationship in Jesus without your faith. You can say, you can say you're religious, but you've got to have a faith. And that faith should drive your decisions and what you're doing, whether that's Sunday morning or Saturday night. As we face uphill, hard battles ahead, you have to remember that you're not alone. You're going to face those trials just like any other person would. I'm, um, in Matthew 17, 20 through 21, he said to them, Because of your little faith, for truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And then Hebrews 4, 14, since I'm teaching a class on Hebrews, I thought I'd throw a verse in. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we have, or we profess. It's likely you're going to face mountains of doubt, and you're going to have faith that's sufficient to move a mountain all in the same day. You may actually have both of those in the same time. Something that's a mountain of doubt that you can't do it, and then a faith that you can move mountains all in the same day, maybe in the same hour. But we've got to have the vision and the fortitude to continue to go on because we're going to encounter deterrence. We're going to encounter things that get in our way, whether it's mountains or molehills, <laughs> whether it really is your Mount Everest, um, that you will see them, that you'll see these things as heaven sent opportunities. They're going to give you change, as James told us. They will charge head forward into them. And as Caleb, um, as Caleb said in Joshua 14, 12, Lord, just give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. And that's pretty much what Wendy looked like the whole trip. She was amazing. I could not believe how many miles she walked, 60 easily, um, climbing mountains. Unbelievable how, uh, how hard she worked. I was worried she might not get a, mi a mile in, um, but not one time hardly did we have to put her on our back, but for a few steps. As I close, there was a man... Um, that um, wrote many different poems or stories for children that unfortunately this day and time is, they're trying to whack him but he's not going to go down this is Dr. Seuss and he wrote something here and I'm going to read it um, because it's so small but I'm going to read it off my, my slides here because I can't read it up there it's so slanted and when you're alone there's a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants there are some down the road between hither and yon that can scare you so much you won't want to go on. So be sure when you step, step with, great, step with care and great tact, and remember that life's a great balancing act. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and 3 fourths percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. Today is your day, your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Mountains are coming and mountains are here, and your mountain is maybe here in your own life right now, ready to be tackled. And as you take it on, you're going to have to find an inner, uh, maybe, and yet to be discovered strength that you're unaware of. But the thing that we, we learn having a faith in Christ is that ours is not 98 and three-fourths guaranteed. Ours is 100% guaranteed. And our, our faith in Jesus gets us to that next destination. You may be here this morning. You may be traveling through a period of your life where you do have mountains that are bothering you that you need to get over and you need to get on top. You have a family here of God at Line Area that want to see you succeed. You have elders that want you to succeed. And you have people here that want you to succeed. Whatever it is, you may need to be baptized into Christ. You may need to become a follower of Christ. If you need to do that, would you please come forward as we stand and offer the invitation.